Good evening and welcome to New York Medical College and the Turo College and University Systems sixth COVID-19 webinar. We began these programs on January 31st of this year and here we are. It's September and we're back for our sixth session. This probably raises for many of you at least three profound questions. First, some of you are probably turning to your partner there at home and saying, look, there's the host, Edward Halperin, the Chancellor CEO of New York Medical College and the Provost for Biomedical Affairs at Turo. Look how old he's getting. I wonder if he's really getting that old looking over the space of these six webinars. The second question you're probably asking yourself is, you think he really knows how to tie those bow ties by hand, or maybe they come pre-tied? And the third question you're probably asking yourself is, my God, six webinars, when is this ever going to end? Well, the answers to your questions are, yep, like all of you, this whole pandemic thing has aged me a lot. Second, yeah, I do know how to tie the bow ties by hand. And third, nope, I don't know when this pandemic is going to end, but I do know that we at New York Medical College and in the Turo College and University System we're going to keep trying to provide you with the most recent information as the pandemic evolves to help you negotiate the situation and for those of you who are healthcare providers to help you take care of your patients. Once again, we've got some old friends and some new friends for this evening's webinar. The old friends are folks that you've met before in previous webinars. You're going to hear from Dr. Robert Andler, Dr. Marissa Montecalvo, Dr. Alan Kadish, Dr. Kathleen DiCaprio, and from me. We'll meet some new friends, Dr. Michael Gowitz and Dr. Mille Etienne, and we're going to run through a list of topics which for the most part have been raised for us by our previous feedback from our previous webinars. Every time we get together, uh, we get lots of questions about how do I get my continuing medical education credit? For those of you seeking CME credit, you can text the code 63WELD, all in capital letters, to 828-295-1144. Or you can go to our CME website, www.eeds.com, click the sign in button, enter that same code 63WELD, and whether you text the message or whether you use the website, you'll start getting instructions as to how to get your CME credit and how to fill out the questionnaire for assessing your satisfaction with this evening's program. I'll appear several times during the presentations this evening to repeat this message, but might I suggest that you write down the phone number or the email address, do a screenshot, or grab your cell phone and take a picture of the screen right now so you can be sure to get your CME credit. For those of you who want to ask questions of our panelists as the program goes on this evening, go to the question and answer setting on your screen for this webinar, type in your question, and we'll monitor the questions as the program goes along, and we'll pose as many of them as we possibly can during the time set aside for Q&A. We hope you find this evening's webinar instructive and engaging, and to get us started, Let's bring up the president of the Turo College and University System, Dr. Alan Kadish, for welcoming remarks and to get our program started. Dr. Kadish. Welcome to the sixth Turo New York Medical College webinar on COVID-19, sponsored by the Center for Disaster Medicine at New York Medical College. The center is a state-funded center designed to train and educate people about disasters, including pandemics. And unfortunately, we're certainly in the middle of one now, which is why the center's work continues to be important. Can we have the first slide, please? This slide shows the daily number of newly diagnosed cases of coronavirus infection on the days of the Turo New York Medical College webinars. As you can see, 
at the time of our first webinar on January 31st, there are only six cases reported in the United States, although we now know it was actually circulating in the community for weeks before then, and no deaths reported. I'd like to say we got everything right at the first webinar, but one thing we did get right was the fact that this was gonna be a significant problem for the world and the United States. And unfortunately, that's proved to be true. As you can see, the number of cases peaked in the spring, particularly in the Northeast and the New York metropolitan area. And then in June, it looked like perhaps COVID-19 was gonna wane significantly, but it then spread to other states. And actually on August 18th, we had the peak number of new cases, at least on the days of our webinar, which have stabilized a little bit, but not decreased that much. This remains a significant problem. The case fatality rate from COVID-19 appears to be decreasing. Now, whether that's a reporting change, diagnosing more mild cases, or whether it has to do with the change in the biology of the disease or better treatment is still not completely clear. It's probably a combination of all three. But even with the apparently declining case fatality rate, COVID-19 remains a major disruption in the United States and elsewhere, and something that we need to continue to learn about. The continued knowledge acquisition about COVID-19 is manifest by continually changing recommendations about how the disease spreads and we, what we ought to do about it from organizations such as the CDC and the World Health Organization. Even in the past week, recommendations and pronouncements are changing. We're learning rapidly about the disease, but it's a new disease and we still have a good deal more to learn. And that's why the Center for Disaster Medicine is sponsoring today's webinar. In today's webinar, we'll talk about some clinical manifestations of the disease that we continue to learn more about, such as cardiac disease and problems with the sense of smell. We will update progress on vaccine development, which by no means done represents a very promising approach to helping us deal with COVID-19. We'll talk about new therapies, such as plasma therapy for COVID-19, and we'll hear about the intersection of politics and science as it relates to COVID-19, something that's been on everybody's mind most recently. We hope by the end of today's webinar that you'll have a better understanding of where we've been, where we are, and what the prospects of the future are, and hope that it means we'll turn the corner soon. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Gowitz, a pediatric cardiologist who'll talk to us about cardiac manifestations of COVID-19. Welcome and thanks for being with us today. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Gowitz, Professor and Vice Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at New York Medical College and Executive Director and Physician-in-Chief at Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital of Westchester Medical Center, the New York Medical College affiliate. I'm pleased to uh, discuss with you tonight uh, COVID-19 and the heart, at least to try to summarize briefly uh, the cardiac involvement uh, which is a subject, could be the subject of an hour discussion in itself. I thank Drs. Kadish and Halpern for the opportunity to share this information with you. Did COVID-19 mess up my heart was a recent article in The Atlantic, which appeared and stirred some controversy. And the answer is certainly yes, very possibly. COVID-19 is known to have direct and indirect myocardial involvement. In fact, in the Glad from the Gladstone Research Institute recently, in vitro assessment of sarcomere changes, these are the sarcomeres in normal, uh, and the influence of COVID-19 in actually chopping them up was uh, discerned. And th this was the first time this direct involvement, at least in vitro, was identified. 
there has been evidence, of course, longstanding that COVID-19 disrupts the angiotensin converting enzyme system, which has a multiplicity of protective effects for the heart and disruption by COVID-19 results in problems, serious problems uh, uh, on its own. It is also known that the cardiac complications from COVID-19 are not usually present early in the infectious process, but do occur later and perhaps are a result of uh, the hormonal effects on the angiotensin converting enzyme system, as well as the myocardial disruption I showed you before. But a variety of testing processes are necessary to discern cardiac changes. As I mentioned, there are multiple types of heart involvement in COVID-19, both the ischemic and non-ischemic forms uh, involving embolic changes and myocardial infarction directly, and also involving inflammatory changes, including pericardial effusion as well as myocarditis and cardiomyopathy and arrhythmia changes. Many patients have secondary right heart changes, even without primary disease of the heart because of the lung disease that so frequently is associated with COVID-19. It turns out that cardiac involvement somewhat depends on how hard you look for it and in whom you look for it. And in a series of series of Chinese patients, uh, ultimately very severe COVID patients who had multiplicity of cardiac assessments were universally found to have cardiac changes. Early on in the initial phase of the epidemic in China, when there were survivors without serious disease who only had biomarker assessment and not other forms of assessment, it was thought that heart involvement was infrequent, but that has changed. In a, a European study involving over a thousand, almost a thousand patients, abnormal echocardiograms were found in nearly half, and those were associated with increasing symptomatology, such that a preponderance of findings were in the severely symptomatic group, but fewer in the mild symptomatic group, but present there nevertheless. And these echo findings involve left and right heart involvement with diastolic and systolic dysfunction in both ventricles. In children, there's a bit of a different story. Uh, children, as we know, do not get acutely ill from acute COVID-19 infection in as great a preponderance as in adults. But nevertheless, they can be seriously affected, especially later on in the course of the illness, as it turns out, with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that's been recently discovered, occurring at two to three weeks after experience, the initial experience with COVID-19. In those children, all systems or many of the systems are involved, particularly neurologic and gastrointestinal. But in these children, 100% of the time, cardiac involvement is noted, some quite serious. Both left and right diastolic and systolic function are noted, but coronary arteries are spared. And that distinguishes the myocardial, uh, the cardiac involvement in COVID-19 in the inflammatory syndrome from other childhood inflammatory syndromes, such as Kawasaki disease. Fortunately, with effective treatment, although the children can be quite ill initially, systolic function recovery occurs speedily, but diastolic function recovery may take longer. We've been involved with a number of these patients here and uh, were participants in two multi-system inflammatory syndrome case series that were published in the New England Journal in uh, uh, this summer, and I referred you to them for more discussion. The recent controversy has centered around athletic participation in older children, adolescents, and particularly young adults, and particularly involving serious athletes. And in these uh, children, it's been found that 
cardiac MRI has played a very important role in discerning involvement of the heart. In particular, increased a high sensitivity and good specificity is noted with uh, a comprehensive cardiac MRI uh, exam, including both uh, gadolinium usage and T extensive T2 mapping, which shows the changes of myocardial inflammatory disease. A recent uh, study, which is still underway, in fact, in Ohio, at Ohio State University by a pediatric cardiologist who's involved with the athletic department there, showed that in a variety of sports, uh, varsity sport players uh, who were median age of 19 and who had COVID-19 infection did in fact show a high proportion of cardiac changes on MRI, even despite negative hormonal troponin-1 studies, electrocardiographic studies, and echocardiograms. And in fact, in a symptomatic patients, as many as 13% did show positive MRI changes. This led to, as you've heard, great controversy and the cessation of sports of, of the football program this fall at Ohio State, although just this week it has been resumed. It, will, it was announced that it will be resumed uh, this October as Dr. Daniel's study continues to proceed. Post-COVID testing in uh, athletes uh, should involve at a minimum a careful clinical exam even in asymptomatic patients with at least two weeks of rest post COVID. Uh, but in anyone who has more specific symptoms uh, associated with potential cardiac disease, a more, much more extensive cardiac profile needs to be developed. And these uh, athletes may need as long as six months of cessation of vigorous sports. In summary, COVID-19 remains a continuing source of new insight and new information, and we're only just beginning to know what we really don't know. Hopefully that will decrease with time. It certainly does affect the heart, both directly and indirectly, in a relatively high percentage of patients, in fact, and in patients of all age groups, even children. The more serious the symptom picture, the more likely and the more serious, the heart disease. Although asymptomatic effect, infection and involvement of the heart does appear to be possible. The more likely there is pre-existing cardiovascular disease, congenital or arteriosclerotic, for example, the more serious the COVID-19 impact on the cardiovascular system. And caution is required in the least when considering strenuous athletic participation after any COVID-19 related illness. And a full cardiovascular profile is usually required if there are any symptoms. There's a lot more to learn and I'll leave you with that. Thanks very much. Good evening. I'm Marissa Montecalvo and I'm speaking on the role of convalescent plasma in the management of severely ill patients with COVID-19. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So convalescent plasma has a long and robust history in infectious diseases. We give passive antibody, antibody produced by someone who has had an infection in many situations, particularly in situations of post-exposure prophylaxis, where either someone has not been vaccinated or it is thought that they may not be able to mount in an immune response to infection. Less commonly, it's used in treatment, usually in situations where there is a fulminant infection that's new, like an outbreak, or in a situation where an infection may progress rapidly, such as with botulism, where you have a toxin-mediated disease. The antibodies that you need when you receive passive antibodies are neutralizing antibodies in viral infections because they block the viral attachment to the receptor. And in this beautiful picture from the journal Science in March, you see the coronavirus spike protein approaching the ACE receptor of the lung. 
In the schematic on the left, the neutralizing antibody is depicted that it would adhere to the virus and create these complexes so the virus can no longer adhere to the receptor, but instead the entire complex would be ingested and phagocytosed. Now the immune response in patients who have had SARS coronavirus 2 infection has been described. The antibody that we are looking for is antibody to the spike protein. And Zhao described this very nicely in clinical infectious diseases. The red line is total antibody. The purple is IgM. The blue is IgG. And at the bottom, you see the numbers of patients without antibodies. So it starts with 173 patients, and by 40 days, everyone has antibody. But here's what's striking. The first week is clearly without an antibody response. That would be the time that passive antibody would be most beneficial. How do we know whether patients who have had infection, how do we know if their antibody will be the antibody that we need, which is this neutralizing antibody? Well, testing for neutralizing antibody is not a simple test. It requires growing live virus, which requires a biosafety level of the laboratory. The test that is used is a plaque reduction assay shown on the left where you dilute plasma serially. <clears throat> and so that diluted plasma, which now has diluted antibody, must then demonstrate reduction in viral plaque formation uh, in the argar plates at the bottom. So to answer the question whether patients who have had infection actually are producing neutralizing antibody, we had the opportunity at the Westchester County Department of Health to collaborate with the New York State Virology Lab. And uh, there, they took samples from patients that were infected in the original New Rochelle cohort in Westchester County, and they were tested for antibody to spike protein 21 days after infection. And what was found was that the higher the antibody level, the greater the neutralization potential when they then looked at whether or not they could neutralize in a plaque reduction assay. But it wasn't 100%. Even at the highest antibody level, 84% met the FDA dilution standard for reduction of viral growth. Uh, and at the 90% the reduction, the number was even less. What do we know clinically? There have been several publications of small uh, cohorts that have received convalescent plasma. The largest by far is the U.S. Expanded Access Program, where they reported on the first 20,000 patients. These patients received one to two units of convalescent plasma. Of note, the donor pool did, uh, there was no minimum IgG. They just had to have IgG present, but there was no quantitative minimum. These patients were sick, as you can see from the description on the left, but importantly, transfusion reactions within the first four hours after receipt of convalescent plasma were less than 1%. And so this appears to be safe. What about efficacy? Well, the same group taking it out another month. Now they had 35,000 patients to report on. Similar severity of illness, as you see on the left. But of note, with each consecutive month, when you look at the severity of illness by month, with each consecutive month, it gets a little bit less. Their endpoint was seven and 30 day mortality. The seven day mortality was significantly lower if the patient received convalescent plasma within three days of symptom onset versus four days or greater. Also, the higher the antibody to spike protein from the donor, the, uh, the lower seven day mortality. But this could only be studied in a small subset of patients for whom there was still serum available to test the level of antibody in the donor. What is clearly needed to determine 
What is happening here is a multivariate analysis to control the time to transfusion, antibody level from the donor, and severity of illness. There are two randomized trials. Only one has been published in a peer-reviewed journal in JAMA from Wuhan. But this trial, unfortunately, was terminated because of lack of enrollment. It was powered for 200 patients. It was terminated after 100 patients because at that point, the outbreak had really slowed down in Wuhan. The endpoint was to be time to clinical improvement within 28 days. <clears throat> they did not show a significant uh, finding at, for that endpoint. However, in the subset of most severely ill patients, there was, there was significantly greater clinical improvement in those who received convalescent plasma. So where are we? My conclusions are the following. In severely ill patients, it appears that convalescent plasma is quite safe. We are not seeing antibody-mediated worsening of disease, which is important because that can occur when you give antibody to someone who has an active infection. Mortality appears to be lower when the plasma is administered early and also is lower if the donor IgG level is high. But clearly, randomized studies are needed to determine the actual benefit in severely ill patients. And clearly, studies, randomized controlled studies, are needed to see what happens in the non-severely ill, the person who has mild disease, if we can take patients at high risk and keep mild disease from progressing to severe disease. And that is a, a situation that makes more sense for passive antibody treatment. Lastly, as you know, the FDA gave an emergency use authorization for the use of convalescent plasma in hospitalized patients. Uh, this <clears throat> may help standardize the important issue of antibody in the uh, of the antibody level in the donor pool. Uh, randomized trials are currently going on throughout the United States and throughout the world, and uh, those will help clarify the benefit of the convalescent plasma in this infection. These are my references. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Dr. Robert Amler, and I have no conflicts to disclose. Well, I'm talking about what's safe with COVID transmission. Let's start with what's not safe. What's not safe is exposure to the virus. So conversely, the defense against COVID is to block exposure. Block exposure at every opportunity because it's obvious. If there's no exposure, there's no infection. If there's no infection, there's no illness, and if there's no illness, there is no risk. But we all know that's easier said than done because it's not as simple as we thought. In the beginning, we said defend against a sneeze or a cough in your face. But we've learned over time that even exhaled breath close enough to you can cause exposure. Look at how many people have gotten COVID infection who don't remember ever being coughed on or sneezed at. Some of them may have simply forgot, but you know that many of them probably either touched surfaces that were coughed on and sneezed on, or they may have walked through a mist like the one you see and picked up the virus along the way. So this is what's needed. Whether you travel or you stay home, the four W's, you need to wear masks, wash your hands, watch distances, and walk away from groups. Simple, the four W's, easier said than done, but you can do it. And we still say six feet. We still say six feet, but let's face it, farther is better still. And walk away from groups, walk away because you need to mind the time and don't linger. Because even with your distance properly observed, if you're in groups, it could be just a matter of time before you could pick up 
some exhaled breath from somebody else in the groups. But okay, here is good news for most of us, for most of the 320 million Americans who have not been infected so far. If you have not been infected so far, then empirically, what you have been doing has worked for you, at least so far. So as we travel around, and now let's travel around my slides for just a moment. Let's think about how we're going to block exposure. First of all, in the gym, look on the left and look on the right. What is going wrong and what's going right? On the left, you see an awful lot of people unmasked, close together, and breathing hard because they're exercising. So there's going to be more exhaled breath coming out that could infect. On the right, we see a gym that's staying as empty as possible, of course, that's spraying down surfaces, wiping down as much as possible. You pays your money and you takes your chances. But basically, if you feel you must go to a gym, balance the risk of COVID against the benefit or pleasure or health benefit of being in the gym but you still got to watch the four W's. Now, what about this? We dread going back to this. Statistics have shown, for example, the MTA still shows an 80% reduction in ridership here in the New York area. Well, you should know that right now, riding with MTA does not look like this. You can see that this would be really bad in terms of the four W's, but there's extensive cleaning going on. It's going on 24 seven and the MTA is, has sped up its schedule of replacing air filters on all of its conveyances in order to better filter the air and bleed in more outside fresh air into its buses and subways and trains. But again, you need to balance the benefit of getting on this conveyance with the risk of exposure. And remember that when you get on a conveyance, whether it's this or whether it's a plane and you're in flight, you could be in a situation on the left or a situation on the right. But in either case, you need to remember that where you sit, even though it feels comfortable and nice, it is not your personal space. It is still a public space and you need to wipe things down and treat it like a public space to remember the four W's and try to block exposure. And remember, no matter how clean or wiped down is your conveyance, again, bus, subway, train, plane, you still need to get to your ride and you need to move through spaces where you're going to need to be closer to people and need to observe the four W's. Well, here we go again. Until better technology arrives, we're gonna have to stay COVID safe. And that means wearing a mask, washing your hands, hand sanitizer, and what other factors, all of them shown here, are going to be important. And remember to get your flu shot number nine. And the bottom line is you can do this. You absolutely can do this. So stay safe because we're all in this together, but we still need to say apart. Thank you. Good evening. This is your host again, Dr. Edward Halperin, with a reminder as to how to ask questions and how to get your continuing medical education credit. If you'd like to apply for CME credit, text the code 63WELD, all in capitals, to 828-295-1144. Or go to our website, www.eeds.com, click the sign in button, and enter the code 63, all capital letters, WELD. Either way you do it, you're going to get a series of instructions that will follow you launching the program with how to get your CME credit and an invitation to fill out your satisfaction questionnaire 
with this evening's program. If you'd like to pose a question of our panelists, go to the Q&A function on your webinar webpage, type in your question, we'll be monitoring them, and we will try to answer as many of the questions as possible during this evening's program. Now, back to the next of our panelists. Hello, I am Mill Etienne, Associate Professor of Neurology and Medicine here at New York Medical College. Today, I will be speaking with you about the neurological symptoms of COVID-19, particularly focusing on disorders of smell and taste. Although COVID-19 is generally thought of as a respiratory illness, at least 35% of patients with COVID-19 develop neurological symptoms. In fact, neurological symptoms are often the initial presentation. COVID-19 cases continue to rise, notably across much of the United States, South America, and Russia. Thus, it is important that we recognize the many different ways that COVID-19 can present, including the neurological manifestations. COVID-19 has numerous ways that it can impact the nervous system. There are four general mechanisms that have been postulated. One, direct cytopathic effects of SARS-CoV-2. Two, secondary effects of severe pulmonary infection like altered mental status from toxic metabolic encephalopathy and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Three, our body's own systemic inflammatory response, which is also known as the cytokine storm. And four, recrudescence of prior neurological injury. Angiotensin converting enzyme two on neurons has been implicated as the entry point of CNS infections by SARS-CoV-2. Human studies using quantitative in vitro autoradiography have shown ACE2 on neurons and glia in the hypothalamus, midbrain, pons, cerebellum, medulla, and the basal ganglia. There have been a wide range of neurological symptoms attributed to SARS-CoV-2. This includes CNS and PNS involvement. For example, headaches are seen in 6.5 to 23% of patients with COVID-19. Other neurological symptoms include dizziness, decreased alertness, difficulty concentrating, seizures, strokes, weakness, muscle pain, and disorders of smell and taste. We will now turn our attention to smell and taste. Disorders of smell and taste are the hallmark, mild, neurological symptoms of COVID-19. The literature shows that anywhere from 66 to 98% of patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 had olfactory or gustatory impairment, possibly related to increased ACE2 receptors expressed in the nasal mucosa and tongue. Whether this is a result of nerve injury or inflammation of the olfactory nerve is unclear. It may be a combination of the two and it may be variable from person to person. These happen to also be two of the cranial nerves that are rarely tested during neurological examination. These photographs depict how I typically test smell and taste in the office. For smell, it is useful to have the patient's eyes closed so they do not use visual stimuli for assistance. A European study demonstrated that 85% of patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 had olfactory symptoms and 88% had gustatory symptoms. Females were more commonly affected and these symptoms were more commonly reported in younger patients, but not in children. Initially, it was thought that COVID-19 does not affect children. However, we have now seen the many reported cases of Kawasaki-like illness with rash and high fever. Interestingly, it does appear that children are less likely to have problems with smell and taste. And this is thought to be because they have less ACE2 receptors. ACE2 receptors peak at ages 40 to 50s in most people. CNS pathology like head trauma, stroke, and viral infections can cause lesions in regions of the central nervous system which are involved in processing taste stimuli, including the thalamus, 
brainstem, and temporal lobes. The disorders of taste that we can expect to see include agusia, hypogusia, and dysgusia. Keep in mind that many people are walking around with these abnormalities and consider themselves asymptomatic because they are not aware that these are symptoms of COVID. It is important to do an actual taste test when patients say they have lost the sense of taste. This is because oftentimes it is not a true loss of taste. Loss of taste can be linked to a loss of smell because the brain combines the perceptions of taste from the mouth with what is known as retronasal olfaction. Loss of taste might be linked to bonding between SARS-CoV-2 and receptors of sialic acid, a component of saliva that protects the glycoproteins responsible for the transport of molecules stimulating taste in the taste pores. As a result of this bond, the degradation of taste particles with an alteration of taste is favored. You probably recall learning about the four types of taste since grammar school, but there is a fifth one known as umami. Umami is a pleasant or savory taste. This refers to the taste for L-glutamate and some five prime ribonucleotides, such as guanosine monophosphate and inosine monophosphate. Now we can move to a closer look at what is happening with the sense of smell. Here we see the olfactory pathway starting from the olfactory receptors, which get the stimulus and transmit it through the cribriform plate to the olfactory bulb, which entry into the CNS. What is interesting about patients who have lost a sense of smell due to COVID-19 is that these patients typically do not have rhinorrhea or congestion. Given that this is isolated loss of smell without other URI symptoms, this is suggestive of primary nasal spread, but this has not been confirmed. It is hypothesized that entry starts in the sustentacular cells, which starts an olfactory inhibition cascade. An immune response is induced, leading to activated lymphocytes and macrophages infiltrating into the olfactory epithelium and an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Sustentacular dysfunction leading to anosmia is consistent with the majority of patients who recover by two weeks. Whereas people with more prolonged anosmia are thought to have neuronal dysfunction. Additionally, stem cell infection may potentially explain why a small fraction of patients experience long-term dysosmia. You will likely see many patients who will have lost their sense of smell and taste, and they'll be worried about whether or not they will get this sense back. You can reassure them and let them know that studies have shown that over 90% of patients get this back within a month. The graph on the left shows data from a French cohort, which demonstrated that on average, patients recovered the sense of smell within nine days, and 98% made a full recovery within four weeks. Likewise, the graph on the right from a South Korean cohort demonstrates that the vast majority of patients will get the sense of smell back in less than one month. And you can see that the vast majority of patients had the sense of smell return in less than three weeks. There will be rare patients who have this linger for a long period of time. It is too early to know whether or not some of them may have permanent loss. It is important to consider the implications of loss of smell and taste. With regards to safety, someone with impaired smell has to be more vigilant about fire alarms since they may not smell the smoke in their house. Gas leaks become a significant concern and you may not detect the smell of dirty diapers. So those people with small babies would have to do more frequent diaper checks. Given that we often rely on smell to tell us if food is spoiled, one has to be more vigilant about checking dates on items to avoid consuming spoiled food. There are also lifestyle implications. Food tastes bland, so people end up eating much more spicy foods. Since food is less enjoyable, people may see some weight loss from eating less. There may also be problems with body odor or use of too much perfume or cologne. Problems with intimacy may develop as it can also be difficult to detect the pheromones from your partner. All the above can lead to problems with mood and anxiety. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Kathleen DiCaprio. I'm an assistant professor of microbiology and immunology at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine, Harlem campus. My presentation today will be an update on vaccine development, including principles of who should and who should not participate in early human vaccine trials. 
I have no conflicts of interest to declare. In the midst of the ongoing historical global SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, there are vital groups of people who are diligently working on COVID-19 vaccines. There are additional groups of people who play a rather different role, but just as vital to the progression of these vaccines. They are the numerous participants who volunteer for these vaccine clinical trials. So in this presentation, we'll be discussing the selection criteria of these vaccine trials, as well as provide an update on the current status of our top vaccine candidates. Let's explore the clinical phase participation a bit. You can see that as the phases progress, the number of participants increases. Now, such an increase in number, especially in phase three, helps gather significance data as well as expand opportunities to identify less common side effects that may have either been absent in earlier phases because of smaller numbers or gone undetected. So let's dig into this a little bit and discuss some principles outlined who should and who should not participate in trials associated with these vaccines. The selection of participants is a vital component to the clinical trial process and includes criteria that allow participation called inclusion criteria, as well as criteria that disqualify participation called exclusion criteria. Now shown here are some common selection criteria of numerous uh, vaccines that are currently in clinical trial across the globe. So let's take a look first at the inclusion criteria. Uh, an important prerequisite is definitely going to be informed consent. Next, we see some demographic criteria, specifically the age range of 18 or older. Now, even though we still have a lot to learn about this virus, age is definitely an important characteristic and factor when it comes to COVID-19. Now, negative pregnancy results and willingness to use contraceptive for sev several months um, uh, during the initial participation are also inclusion criteria. Additional criteria include being healthy with or without pre-existing conditions, just as long as those medical conditions are considered stable. So let's move a little, let's move over to the exclusion criteria. These include immunosuppression, prior or concomitant vaccine therapy for COVID-19, history of laboratory confirmed COVID-19, or seropositivity for the virus before enrollment. Having reviewed the selection criteria, some of the selection criteria to participate in these vaccine trials, let's shift the presentation a bit and look at vaccine data projections, as well as some recent updates of our top vaccine candidates. There are four vaccines right now in phase three, with the anticipated phase three data, initial phase three data, sometime being released sometime in this fall. Let's hope. All right. Moderna and Pfizer each have a novel nucleic acid vaccines. AstraZeneca's vaccine is built into a non-replicating adenoviral vector, and the Sinovac inactivated vaccine just initiated phase three, so they just started. Now, there are two additional vaccines, both of which are in phase one and phase two, and they've demonstrated encouraging early data, and they're hoping to move into phase three soon. Those are the Novavax and the Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Now, recently, there have been a few updates that have surfaced from a few of these vaccine candidates. A few weeks ago, AstraZeneca announced that they would halt phase three trials to more thoroughly investigate a participant who developed transverse myelitis. Now, although after review of the case, the trial in the UK has resumed, the, the trial in the US is still on hold and they're still reviewing it. The Pfizer vaccine recently submitted an addendum to their phase three trial to expand the number of participants to 44 thousand people. This is a big increase from the previous goal of 30,000. They say this is an effort to recruit a more diverse group of participants. They state that based on the current infection rates, they hope to have efficacy data, some efficacy data available by the end of October. Moderna continues to release enrollment data, revealing recent numbers of approximately 24,000 participants, of which 27% 27% are from diverse communities. Now, given the global anticipation and need for a COVID-19 vaccine, it isn't surprising that the big questions often focus on when will a safe and effective vaccine be ready? Unfortunately, only time will tell at this point. So as a conclusion to the presentation, I've included some how, 
and when will we know these? So how and when will we know if a vaccine is safe and effective in children? Now the rates of severe COVID-19 in children have not been as high as that seen in adults, but we still need to learn more about this. So before making decisions about the inclusion of children in vaccines, we really should learn from the current trials with adults. How and when will we know if a vaccine is safe in the elderly? Now, most current trials do have, a, have large ranges, and it'll be important to, to continue to enroll older patients across this age span. Early phase one and phase two data of some of these vaccines in adults older than 55 have been encouraging. How and when will we know if a vaccine is good enough to provide adequate protection against COVID-19? Guidance released by the FDA states that a vaccine needs to be at least 50% effective at preventing either laboratory confirmed COVID-19 or laboratory confirmed viral infection or whatever the study has identified as their primary efficacy endpoint. So for example, this means that for an individual who's vaccinated with a good vaccine, they would be 50% less likely to get COVID-19, for example. As I mentioned earlier, only time will tell what the data will be from numerous vaccine trials. In the meantime, I don't know about you, but I'm still waiting. Thank you. Good evening. This is Dr. Edward Halperin, the Chancellor and CEO of New York Medical College and the Provost for Biomedical Affairs of the Turo College and University System, to chat with you for a few minutes about a question which was posed after our last webinar. Is there anything historically unique about asserting that the science of COVID-19 is becoming so politicized? I have no conflict of interest to declare in regards to this evening's presentation. What are sort of exemplars of politics and medicine in our own time during the pandemic? Well, we faced a very uh, profound one last week as I was preparing the talk this evening. At a press conference, the President of the United States contradicted the Director of the Center for Disease Control, both on the use of the vaccine and when it will become available, and on the use of masks in dealing with the public health threat of COVID-19. And once again, we had various pundits decrying the interference of politics in the response to COVID-19. Is this a unique phenomenon? Well, a good way to start our exploration of this topic is to look at the etymology of the word politics. From whence does this word come? And what does it really mean? Well, it comes from Aristotle, uh, from a book, Politica, referring to affairs of the cities. The word politics comes from words like polites or polis, citizen or city, we see this all the time in common language. Annapolis, Minneapolis, Constantinople, the use of the root polis for city. Polites, polites, citizen, these are all words which form the etymology of the word which comes down to us, politics, the way in which people in groups make decisions. Politics is about making agreements between people so the people are capable of living together in groups, such as a tribe, or a city, or a state, or in countries. Whenever people get together to try to come to some form of consensus as to how they will live together, they are engaged in politics, including deciding how the public will respond to a public health crisis. That is, by definition, engaging in politics, it is close to a tautology. Now, doctors like to think they're objective scientists working either above or outside the pull and tug of society. Doctors like to think that they are above and beyond politics because they are scientists. But my main message for this evening is that that's just flat wrong. I was taught this as a medical student by my professor of the history of medicine at the Yale Medical School, George Rosen. It was one of those situations where as a student, you don't realize how famous your professor is 
until about 20 years after you're out of school. And I realized that I had the privilege of being taught by one of the 20th century's great medical historians. Among Professor Rosen's major contributions to the history of medicine were that medicine is also a fundamentally social activity. The practice of medicine always is conducted in every era of history in the context of its particular time and place. It is not free of the pull and tugs of society and politics. It is intimately intertwined with the pull and tug of society and politics. But let's look at some examples. Example one, the social invention of a disease or identifying things as diseases, which really aren't because of social pressures. A great surgeon of the 19th century was the English surgeon, Joseph Lister. Lister contributes the germ theory of the infection of surgical wounds and the use of antisepsis using carbolic acid soap bandages and spray to reduce the risk of wound infection. He is a lion of surgery, one of the great contributors to surgical progress. Some St. Louis businessmen pharmacists decide to steal Lister's name in the middle of the 19th century and create an antiseptic solution in a bottle without Lister's express permission. They call it Listerine. It's mostly alcohol and it doesn't sell well at all. They hire an advertising company to try to do something with the product and see if it can increase sales in the early part of the 20th century. What do they do? They invent a disease currently unknown to medicine and they call it halitosis. You see, you're gonna be left out of the social whirl in the roaring 20s because you've got halitosis, bad breath, whereas other women get the guy, you have to sit like a wallflower because you've got halitosis. This previously unknown disease causes sales of Listerine to skyrocket. And it is an example of the intersection of society and medicine inventing a disease to sell a product where one didn't exist. Other examples of 19th and 20th century diseases which were created for political reasons are greatly influenced by politics. Calling a disease hysteria, thinking that it was predominant in women and had a relationship to the wandering uterus, thus hysteros, the uterus, hysterectomy, hysteria. Well, of course, there is no wandering uterus. It's an invented term for the purpose of showing male dominance over women. Saying that there were some people unfit to bear children enforced sterilization against a woman's will for eugenic reasons is certainly the influence of politics on medicine. Is alcoholism a moral failing or a biologically determined disease? Another example, and uh, perhaps most striking in my time in medicine, when I was a medical student in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Diseases, there was a listing for homosexuality. Now there's a listing for homophobia. Nothing changed biologically. What changed were societal and political attitudes. These are all examples of the invention of diseases or the deletion of diseases by politics. Example two, the political response to AIDS. Uh, those of us of a certain age will remember the early 1980s when a new disease strikes the human population. Eventually it is called human immunodeficiency virus and the disease is called AIDS. And the Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich of Georgia, seriously proposes the quarantine of the entire island of Manhattan. The disease is a disease of the four H's, heroin addicts, homosexuals, Haitians, and hemophiliacs. Something must be done. Politicians say that AIDS is a divine punishment for homosexuality. The President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, says close to nothing about the epidemic and gets into a pull and tug with his own Surgeon General, the pediatric surgeon C. Everett Koop, who does take a firm stance on trying to stop the spread of the AIDS epidemic. As the historian Schultz writes in the popular book and the band played on, politics, people, and the AIDS epidemic, the bitter truth was 
that AIDS did not just happen to America, it was allowed to happen. Example three, uh, the creation of the March of Dimes and the political and financial will to create a polio vaccine are in part driven in our history by politics. Why do we have a polio vaccine developed by Salt and Sabin in the 1950s? Where did all the money and the political will come to develop this vaccine? It was because the President of the United States, for four terms, he lived for 12 years as President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, was in a wheelchair because of polio. The President could not walk, although he was portrayed as sometimes standing with the aid of braces, but always firmly pushing on a podium or with a walking stick. And through the President of the United States, we created the March of Dimes, with the popular singer and movie star Eddie Cantor to raise money for the creation of a polio vaccine, another example of the influence of politics on medicine. Example four, when Richard Nixon promised the American people a war on cancer, which would produce results, he signed federal laws to create the modern system of the National Cancer Institute and the network of NCI comprehensive cancer centers. Did you ever wonder why the director of the National Cancer Institute does not report to the director of the NIH? No, the director of the National Cancer Institute reports directly to the President of the United States. Is that about medicine or is it about politics? Well, it's about politics because Richard Nixon promised the war on cancer. Do you ever wonder why we spend relatively so little on major cancer killers like lung cancer and head and neck squamous cell cancer? We spend so much money relatively on breast cancer and prostate cancer? It's because people in positions of power much more often get breast cancer and prostate cancer. While with smoking incidences changing in the United States, cancer of the head and neck and lung cancer is increasingly becoming diseases of the poor, the black, the brown, and the marginalized in society. Very much an example of politics and cancer medicine. Well, the truth is that medicine, professedly founded on observation, is as sensitive to outside influences, political, religious, philosophical, imaginative, as is the barometer to the clash of atmospheric density. But look a moment while I clash a few facts together and see if some sparks are not revealed by their light a closer relation between the medical sciences and the conditions of society and the general thought of time than would at first be suspected, said Oliver Wendell Holmes in the 19th century. Uh, let's wrap up with an example of a pandemic the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919. It's interesting that the death rates from the pandemic were very different in New York compared to Philadelphia. And these appear to be related to the attitudes of local politicians concerning social distancing and their impact on societal morale and the local economy. In this contemporary graph, you can see that the peak death rates in Philadelphia were much higher than in New York, approaching almost twice as high. The public health officials in the city of New York was C. Royal Copeland, the former Dean of Medicine at New York Medical College, who recommended social distancing and mask wearing. Whereas the public health officials in Philadelphia said, we can't do anything to stifle the economy. It's okay to have parades to get people's uh, morale up and you don't need to have a mask on or separate yourself during the parades. As they sow it, so did they reapeth. The death rates in Philadelphia were much higher than those in New York from the pandemic, a very clear indication of the influence of politics on medicine. So, when the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, says to an audience, as you know, my administration is doing everything possible to protect the American people, the American economy from the coronavirus, and crosses out the word corona and writes China, and people start talking about the influence of politics on medicine. My point is that politics has always been intertwined with medicine. And President Trump is simply another politician in a long line of individuals who as politicians have interfered with or attempted to influence medicine. So the issue really is not whether or not politicians get intertwined with medicine. It is your view as a citizen of whether that interference is for the good or for the bad. Thank you for listening. 
Good evening. This is once again your host, Dr. Edward Halperin. We hope you've enjoyed our panel presentations. We're going to soon be moving to the question and answer segment. For those of you who wish to get CME credit, text the code 63WELD, all in capitals, to 828-295-1144, or go to our CME website, www.eeds.com, click the sign in button and enter that same code 63WELD. And in either case, you'll start getting a series of instructions on your electronic device as to how to get your CME credit and how to fill out the questionnaire regarding your satisfaction with this evening's program. Uh, might I suggest that you get your cell phone out and take a picture of the screen or do a screenshot or write these phone numbers and instructions down so you can get your CME credit. If you'd like to pose a question of our panelists and you've not done so yet, go to the question and answer function on your webinar webpage and type in your question. We'll be monitoring them and we'll distribute the questions to our panelists and get as many answered as we possibly can. And now let's turn our attention to the question and answer segment of our program to moderate our Q&A portion of the program. Once again, Dr. Alan Kadish, the president of the Turo College and University System. So I'd like to thank the presenters for a great series of presentations. And we've got some time for a number of fascinating questions that have come from the audience. Not surprisingly, many are about vaccines, which we all hope will have a significant impact on COVID-19. So the first question for Dr. Caprio is, what's considered an event of importance in a vaccine trial? How do we define endpoints? And what do you think about the New York Times op-ed that suggested that the endpoints in the current vaccine trials aren't the right ones and we might get a vaccine that won't do what we really want it to do. Dr. DiCaprio. Thank you. These are wonderful questions. And unfortunately, there are still answers that we need. Looking at events of importance in a vaccine trial. So there's, there's a couple of questions here. Um, there are several in, important events that we're looking for, both positive, looking at reductions in disease, or viral replication, but also negative looking at adverse events. So these trials are looking at a lot of different um, uh, variables. Um, so let's start by looking at some symptomatic and asymptomatic infections. Those are definitely events of, of importance um, as well as laboratory confirmed infection with the virus. Now, although we can be hopeful it's unlikely that these vaccines will be 100% effective at preventing viral, viral replication. That's just a likelihood, all right, or an unlikelihood, let me put it that way. Um, this is very important, though, especially for assessing asymptomatic infections. A patient can be asymptomatic and harboring replicating virus, which could spread. So we're going to be looking at those confirmed um, in, uh, viral infections, symptoms, um, um, as well as asymptomatic spread. Now, because the symptoms vary and COVID-19 disease varies, um, it's important that these events related to symptomatic infection include observed reductions um, or lack thereof in the diagnoses of COVID-19 disease and or variations of severity in COVID-19 vaccine, COVID-19 disease. So there's a lot of variables that are being assessed in these studies. They're called endpoints. There are primary and secondary endpoints in these studies. And all of these are being measured um, at various levels in various populations in these studies. So there, this, there, there are lots of pieces in these studies, which kind of ties into that article. Um, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not very familiar with the article. I did, I did skim it recently. Um, so I apologize if I'm not up to par um, with everything that was said in that article. But a few things that did strike me in that article had to do with the comments about not including certain populations of people. And that those are valid points. But I do want to point out that many trials do not include those populations. Um, and we have numerous vaccines and drug therapies on the market currently for, 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 for many pathogens. Um, the reference to influenza in the article was definitely a valid one where there was mention of how the influenza vaccine um, is 
is definitely one that targets mild disease and healthy individuals, but may not play much of a role with older individuals. I should point out that the influenza virus we know has heavy mutation rates. We know that it has uh, antigenic drift every year and antigenic shift, which we've seen with H1N1 to get a little molecular for you here. So we know a lot about flu. We don't know that yet about COVID. So to make those types of, um, you know, those, the, those types of concerns are valid, but we can't answer that, nor can we validate them. Regarding the population of people, one example that's, that I wanna just highlight is pregnancy. Ex, in, ex, um, inclusion criteria for these studies is that they can't be pregnant, all right? The like, there, we many trials will enroll in an individual who is not pregnant and who agrees to not get pregnant things happen, okay? Uh, it, things happen, and there are many instances where um, uh, women get pregnant in the middle of a trial. And those women oftentimes remain in the trial. They choose to. And so those individuals will be monitored. They, they've signed informed consent. They will continue to make decisions if they want to stay in the trial. And so those individuals will continue in the trial and they will be evaluated continuously. There will be additional variables that will be evaluated for them as well. Um, and so those were some things that did strike, that did um, I want to just highlight from that article and mention we are also looking at symptoms, not, uh, asymptomatic spread, virus, there are lots of variables. Um, so I hope that answered the numerous questions that you gave me there. Absolutely. So I have uh, one quick follow up question. Uh, are you willing to handicap the likelihood that we'll have a vaccine in the next six months? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Um, I will tell you that, you know, I having worked with the Ebola vaccine um, uh, with the, in the adenoviral backbone, I can highlight how the Johnson & Johnson phase three trial started just a few days ago um, that's using a similar backbone. Um, you know, there, we have seen examples of trials that can move forward when there is need, um, but we are dealing with a lot of extenuating circumstances right now. So, many things that we've never seen before in a public health realm. And so time will tell, we can just only hope for the best. Thank you very much. So the next uh, couple of questions is for Dr. Montecalvo and it relates to mask wearing first. Um, there are some potential negative psychological effects of mask wearing and there are potentially negative physiologic effects which are decrease in oxygen concentration and potentially uh, hypoxia's effect on the immune system. So how would you put that together in the paradigm of should we wear masks and are there things we should be concerned about in mask wearing, perhaps particularly exercising while mask wearing. Thank you. Uh, so masks are tough, they really are, and it's very hard to have one on all day long. Regarding the physiologic effects of masks, I, it's an excellent question. I am unaware of any really good studies that, that show that there's an adverse effect to wearing the mask physiologically all day long. Uh, there certainly are psychological downsides to wearing it. And uh, everyone, I think at certain times, you know, if, if you need to take a break, you need to go outside to a place where you can be outdoors and get a breath of fresh air by yourself and uh, have some time away from other people. Um, but I, I'm not aware of true physiologic consequences of wearing a mask for a prolonged period. Uh, we are, you know, particularly in hospitals, it's difficult, but, but people have been able to do it. I, and I'm sorry that I, don't know the studies offhand, but I have not seen anything along those lines at all. Clearly, uh, in other infectious diseases, there are many situations where people need to wear masks for prolonged periods of time, TB and other situations. That's great. A quick follow-up question on a slightly related topic. <clears throat> you presented some very interesting data about plasma therapy. We've also seen some data on dexamethasone and remdesivir in seriously ill patients. 
Would you use all three? Do you think one is better than the other? How would you approach that clinically? Yeah, so I think, uh, thank you. So I think you, you really want to follow the study. Uh, so the plasmapheresis, as I, I try to uh, you know, bring the point across, it, it's unclear. And in theory, it's best early on, even though we're using it in severe, it's being used in hospitalized patients who are often going to be sicker. Uh, but I think that uh, the plasma, uh, sorry, it's not plasma free, it's the plasma therapy uh, receipt of neutralizing antibody, probably a good idea early on uh, if you have access to it. And certainly remdesivir, if you're hospitalized and have have pneumonia, is will will should shorten the course of illness as well as dexamethasone. So I think. For the person who is sick enough to be hospitalized with pneumonia, dexamethasone, and remdesivir are, are pretty standard. And, uh, and I think that the use of neutralizing antibody, in theory, could be beneficial earlier, but, those, but we do not have data yet on that. Great. Thank you very much. So now uh, a couple of questions for Dr. Amler. We always save uh, the easy ones for him. Um, what would you do about trick or treating on Halloween is the first question. Would you send your kids out, uh, presumably with masks, which they probably are wearing anyway on Halloween, uh, or do you think there's just too much danger of community transmission? Well, look, uh, trick or treat are probably some of the three most wonderful words you hear when you open your door on the evening of October 31st. Uh, and like all holidays, we enjoy them. Many people really have fun on a typical Halloween, but the virus does not suspend its operations for our holiday. The virus doesn't know a holiday. And if there's a problem with social distancing, if there's a problem with uh, connection and handing out candy and interacting in a haunted house in someone's house uh, or going to a holiday party, that's going to be a problem. But in fact, you can enjoy Halloween if someone has a backyard and set up a haunted house outdoor experience in the fresh air with a single uh, file of directions so people are not passing each other, just like in a, a grocery store or supermarket where the aisles are unidirectional, you can do that. Now, the big problem is the masks. Once again, it's kind of ironic. The one time you think you can wear a mask would be Halloween, but the Halloween plastic molded masks that children wear and some young adults uh, are just not suitable. They don't protect. Many of them are open around your mouth and the sides of the mask uh, leave too much space uh, from your face. Uh, it's also ironic that the little eye holes in the mask could get pushed up by the uh, cloth or procedure mask you're wearing. And so those eye holes are offset from the eyes. Children won't be able to see and they'll trip and fall. So basically this is a Halloween with only your procedural or cloth mask and gotta keep away from other people. Okay, and uh, later on Dr. Amler will give us the 800 number to purchase the Amler Haunted House, which he described so nicely. <laughs> um, let me ask you uh, another question that came up about planes, trains, and automobiles. So you talked a little bit about wearing masks and distancing and how to go about things. So obviously there's some people who have to travel for essential work, uh, for sort of major life events, but suppose you didn't have to travel. Uh, no, thank God no one in the family's dying you don't have to go to work on the train. Um, would you take planes, trains, and automobiles for an elective kind of trip these days? Well, let's face it. You know, uh, we are sick and tired of this virus, but the virus is not tired of making us sick. So I would simply say this, how important is it really? Uh, you're gonna go on a plane because you have to, and you're gonna do all these precautions. But the basic element of prevention is don't go if you don't have to. 
Now, if, it, if you feel it's important, there's family reasons, whatever, uh, you make that deci decision. It's a free country. But uh, it's kind of like, you know, you want to put your foot in the swamp where there's crocodiles, but you have crocodile repellent that's going to protect you. Much better not to go in the swamp water to begin with. Stay away from crocodiles. Stay away from the virus every chance you get. Thank you. So the next question is a question about singing, perhaps in a choir, uh, indoors, um, if there is some distancing. I'm going to actually let Dr. Etienne uh, weigh in on that. He commented in the email train a little bit about it. So uh, Dr. Etienne, um, what do you think about uh, the risk of singing and how would you uh, respond to uh, someone who said, can I go to an indoor venue and listen to a choir where people are singing? perhaps in a religious service, perhaps in other cases? Yes, thank you for that uh, great question. So yeah, as many of us know, uh, very early on in the pandemic, that was a, actually a very common way of having widespread uh, spread of the virus was from uh, choirs in, in church services. Um, so that can be, you know, when you're singing, you're actually propelling a lot of the, you know, particles from your mouth out into the, you know, into the public or into the audience, whoever, whoever's around, even in close company, if it's just a small group of people, uh, there's a very high risk for, for spread. Um, I know a lot of people at, you know, many churches uh, and other religious, uh, you know, houses of worship um, have actually banned um, singing uh, during those services um, in order to avoid the spread. Um, in fact, that seems to be a bigger issue than even the people. And obviously, if you go into a church service or any other venue, you want to be six feet apart, um, but definitely, I would not. I personally would not recommend going to any place where there's going to be singing, where there's a risk for having the particles spread uh, to infect anyone. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, the next question I'm actually going to direct to Dr. Halpern, uh, but uh, perhaps Dr. Amler will weigh in as well. Will our COVID-19 experience change the way we conduct future pathogen surveillance? Uh, I'm not sure we do a very good job at pathogen surveillance now, so perhaps the question is, uh, should we start some form of routine pathogen surveillance as a practical, and would it help? Uh, thank you, Dr. Kadish. The, I suppose the great tragedy of the 21st century is our failure to learn the lessons of threats from the 20th century, 100 years after the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918-19, we're still talking about the similar issues. Uh, 75 years after the explosion of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we have not dealt with the public health threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. And now uh, roughly 40 years after the arrival of HIV, we have not fully as a society dealt with the issues of homophobia or racism and their uh, association with the spread of infectious disease. So the pessimist would say we haven't gotten it right now, so why do we think we're going to get better at pathogen surveillance in the future? The optimist would say, first of all, we know that the military has created new forms of intelligence saying that the threat to the American people is not only a military attack, but effects on the safety of Americans from climate change, infectious disease, and social upheaval. And so there are people thinking very critically about pathogen surveillance as a form of military intelligence representing a threat to the United States preparedness. Another thing a optimist might say is that during the Obama administration, a great deal of effort was put into the creation of surveillance techniques and expansion of such techniques, which were disabled during the current administration, but the playbooks were all established and could be put back into use with the correct political will. I would say finally, as a matter of optimism for pathogen surveillance, it's these. There are all sorts of things we can now do with the way people text message each other or email each other or move around, which can be detected by these electronic devices, which can create an early warning system for infectious outbreaks. So our traditional notion of pathogen surveillance is what laboratory tests are we going to do to measure them may to some extent be supplanted by sociological uh, 
tests used in intersection with information technology to see if we start sending each other's text messages about people having fevers, being infected, coughing, being exposed to something, and that we will pick up such intelligence and know how to react to it uh, early on because of our use of electronic devices. Between my choices of being an optimist and a pessimist, I will prefer to be an optimist and that we will ultimately do better about pathogen surveillance. Uh, it's a time when we could use some optimism. So thank you for that, Dr. Halpern. Um, next question I'm gonna actually ask Dr. Gowitz to chime in on. Um, so one of our uh, listeners asked, uh, citing some examples from undergraduate colleges where a lot of people have become infected, but not many people have become critically ill, suggests that the risk in college age students is pretty low. So the part of the question, uh, Dr. Gowitz, that I wanted uh, you to take a look at is, um, isn't there a risk of cardiac disease, perhaps even late cardiac effects, even if people seem to be relatively mildly symptomatic? And isn't the fact that people aren't getting sick potentially an illusion? Hi, uh, yes, uh, thanks Dr. Kadish for that uh, challenging question. Um, yes, uh, there is some scant evidence, not well-defined, that many asymptomatic people can have minimal or even mild cardiovascular changes, at least on sophisticated MRI testing. Whether that's relevant to physiologic consequence has yet to be determined. I think the, uh, the safety, it is true though, that college age students for a variety of reasons fit into that uh, category of uh, generally lesser severity from acute COVID illness. That being said, I think the precautions that um, Phelan and others have recently uh, described concerning anyone who is of college age and interested in vigorous athletics, get a, at least a good cardiovascular clinical examination before considering resumption and sustain a period of refraining for at least uh, two weeks or so from resumption of activity after demonstrating uh, resolution of any acute COVID picture. And then finally, resuming on a slow basis rather than going right back into the fray are probably reasonable at this point. It's uh, to be determined really how the, what the frequency is regarding uh, mild cardiac changes in mild or no symptoms. So I'll just, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gowitz. I'll just add to that as a college president, this is obviously an issue that I'm dealing with every day. Um, how concerned should we be about infection in college students? Are there restrictions that have been placed appropriate? And uh, what I can tell you thinking back on our last six COVID webinars, um, there's just a lot about this relatively new disease that we don't know. And late cardiac effects, possible mild neurologic effects, other things that we haven't learned about yet are still significant possibilities because the bacteria, in addition to not caring about politics or, or Halloween, also seems to constantly surprise us. And I'm sorry, the virus. And I would be very concerned about passing off large numbers of infection in college age students and assuming that they're all gonna be okay. Um, quick follow-up questions uh, for Dr. Montecalvo. Um, one of the questioners is a special ed teacher and works with a student who can't wear a mask. So the teacher wears a couple of masks. Question is how safe is that? Does the teacher need to be concerned about transmission from his special ed student? Um, obviously an uncommon problem, but one that's really important because we wanna make sure that no students get left behind in this situation, but what is the risk of transmission when the other party can't wear a mask? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, so if the other party can't wear a mask, obviously there is more risk of transmission than if you were both wearing a mask. But I think, you know, there are situations where it cannot be done. So I think if the teacher can wear a surgical 
procedure mask as opposed to uh, just a mask that is, uh, you know, a mask that you make out of, um, out of fabric, but one that's actually a procedure mask because those masks we know are, are tested and, and, and will prevent transmission in settings where there are droplets, like is the case with, with COVID, with the SARS uh, coronavirus too. So I think the teacher needs to wear a, mask, a good mask, a surgical procedure mask that, that is, is clearly well, uh, well fitted. And I don't think there's a reason to wear more than one mask. I think you want to wear one good mask and then just be scrupulous about hand hygiene and disinfection of the immediate environment the best that you can. Uh, it's not a perfect world. Not everyone can wear a mask, be fully protected, and always have the distancing that we're suggesting, that we're requiring. But I, I think a well-fitting procedure mask would be fine in that situation with careful attention to everything else. Thank you. So uh, we have time for the last couple of questions, which will be for Dr. Amler once again. Um, one question is, what's your opinion about outdoor sports such as soccer? Is it safe to play them in the current environment? You know, the problem with all sports, uh, we've talked before about gyms and about exercise, uh, is the hyperventilation, you're putting out more breath. But soccer is generally played outdoors. As, as, as an outdoor activity, it is relatively safe. But remember too, that players tend to bunch together on the field, uh, they close distances, you really cannot play an exertion sport like that with a mask on and be effective. So uh, I would put it in the medium range of risks. Uh, there are some specific guidances from the CDC on their website, cdc.gov, G-O-V, uh, and you can get some specific recommendations about outdoor sports like golf, basketball played on an outdoor court, uh, soccer, and so forth. But remember that all activity with other people where you're getting close raises the possibility of the virus spreading from person to person. And the last question, Dr. Amler, what kind of PPE would you recommend for doctors doing aerosol procedures, dental aerosol procedures, endoscopies? How concerned do healthcare providers need to be and what do you think they should wear? Is a mask enough or is more extensive it is definitely a concern, and there are uh, published standards for, uh, basically, these are what are called universal precautions. It's not just COVID, but other infections that we have to protect our healthcare providers against. And this would include a face shield, goggles, uh, gowns, masks, gloves, uh, and all of this, because contact with the secretions from your patient you're working on, uh, these are all potentially infectious and should be regarded as such. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciate everyone's presentation as well as the excellent questions from the audience. So I'm gonna wish you all good night, stay healthy, wear masks, be safe, and we'll talk to you again soon. Have a good night.